Uh, good day, everyone. My name is Brian Yeager, an Associate Director for InfoTrends Digital Marketing and Media Trends Service. And I want to thank you all for attending today's book business webinar sponsored by OSE, uh, Book Publishing, Pushing Profit with Digital Technology. Um, and to give you a little bit of an overview about what we're going to talk today, uh, talk about today, um, you know, digital print production techniques make it possible to publish books in quantities of one or even several hundred. Uh, the, the new digital print model replaces costly, time-consuming uh, manual techniques with automated processes that minimize risk for publishers uh, by printing books in, in shorter runs or even on demand. Um, in, in digital book production, it isn't just a, a different way of printing and binding books. It's really an approach uh, that alters the entire book publishing value chain, enables better book lifecycle management, and allows for book printers to alternate runs between offset and digital uh, based on a title's life cycle and, and other needs. Uh, so today what we're going to do is we're going to explore how digital print technology uh, profitability impacts everyone involved in book publishing and the production value chain, uh, including some of the enabling technologies to drive short-run books on demand, uh, how publishers are leveraging di digital book production to drive their own profitability, and how book manufacturers are uh, profitably meeting the, the needs of publishers with these different types of solutions. Um, but before we get started, uh, let me point out uh, a few quick tips to, to make the most of today's live webinar for you. Uh, first, if you have any technical difficulties, uh, troubleshoot by clicking on the help widget at the bottom of the console marked with a question mark, or let us know via the Q&A box. Uh, you can also find the Q&A box to submit your questions to today's panelists. Uh, we'll be addressing select questions during and at the end of the hour. Uh, so you can send them in at any time. Please feel free to do that. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, please make sure you turn off any pop-up blockers on your computer so that you can utilize all the widgets and the bells and whistles of the console that you're using. And uh, speaking of bells and whistles, please click on uh, the Tips for Attendees widget below to learn what all the widgets of this console actually do and how you can customize it for uh, your experience today. So today I'm joined by two great speakers that will tell their story about how digital, uh, digital print book production is driving profits in their businesses. And uh, first up, we have Adam Whitware, the Director of Publishing Technology at O'Reilly Media. Uh, a little bit, bit of background on O'Reilly. They were founded in 1978. They're the publisher of the iconic animal books for software developers. And they've built a business of spreading the knowledge of innovators uh, through the books, online services, magazines, research, and conferences um, that, uh, that the company provides. Uh, our second speaker today will be Kent Larson, and he is the Vice President of Bridgeport National Bindery. Uh, Bridgeport National Bindery has made its name on providing book binding of uh, uh, high quality and has adapted its business over the years to include print-on-demand services, a lot of which we'll be uh, talking about today with Kent. Uh, and uh, just as an agenda, we'll be, we'll be, I'll be uh, giving a quick introduction with some uh, market overview information. Adam will be talking about digital printing and how O'Reilly Media is using digital printing. And then uh, Kent, Kent will talk about how uh, his business, Bridgeport National Bindery, is pushing profits with uh, digital print technology that they have in place. Um, so just to, to start out today, uh, if we look at the uh, executive summary of the 2011 Book Stats Annual Comprehensive Study on the U.S. Publishing Industry. Um, it, it shared a lot of interesting things about the role of technology and how it's shaping the publishing industry. Um, technology has really changed how content is created, formatted, designed, stored, printed, digitized, distributed, and sold. Uh, and as a result, new content products are being created, new channels are emerging, and revenues are really shifting among the different formats. The, the, the revenue mix is diversifying more within the book publishing world. I think you're probably all familiar with that. Um, these changes have really touched virtually all participants in the book publishing industry. That includes authors, publishers, service providers, uh, printers, manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers, and, and consumers, everybody in between. Um, and uh, also, you know, this technology has really democratized uh, the, the, the publishing process really offers virtually anyone the ability to publish their own books, publish their own information out, uh, while also providing new opportunities for uh, some traditional publishers to streamline their operations and reach broader audiences. Uh, you know, if we look at the, the book publishing industry in general, 
From 2008 to 2010, uh, the U.S. publishing industry grew uh, almost 6 percent, 5.6 percent. It resulted in tw almost $28 billion in net revenue uh, from over 2.5 billion units sold in 2010. And you know, we really find that modern technology and services are, are key drivers to this growth in the publishing industry. Um, you know, technology across the book publishing value chain uh, is, is driving help to drive this growth. Uh, it's really driving this growth. Uh, advancements in content creation technologies such as template-driven book design, graphic design software, layout and composition tools, and content management, uh, they've all helped streamline workflows and lower production costs for traditional publishers. And they've created a new market for self-publishers, as we mentioned. We look at companies like Blurb and Lulu.com. They really empower individuals to create, produce, and sell their books online uh, using uh, different types of software tools, uh, while other companies, uh, like we'll talk about with Bridgeport National Bindery, are really providing current production platforms to enable larger publishers to produce uh, a book of one, the on-demand books, or uh, short-run books uh, versus uh, doing longer runs with offset. Uh, and to that point, uh, digital print workflow technologies enable publishers to reduce their risk, uh, reduce their inventories, and lower their capital expenditures. And, and these cost savings are allowing companies to reinvest in new business models, uh, new formats, and new distribution channels. Uh, the cumulative effect of these results is an expanded number of titles and uh, uh, more channels to uh, reach consumers, to reach those readers that, that want to actually read that content and access that content. Um, so, you know, if we if we look, why is um, why is digital printing uh, why is digital printing critical uh, to drive profitability in book publishing? Uh, InfoTrends, actually, in partnership with Book Business Magazine, we conducted a study of over 100 book publishers earlier this year. Uh, to help answer some of these questions about uh, digital printing and how it's driving profitability. Um, and, you know, we all know in the publishing industry there's a lot of emphasis being uh, placed on creating, distributing, and monetizing uh, e-books and other types of electronic content. But it's important if we, if we look at uh, the chart here, um, you know, it's important to remember that print books still represent three-quarters of publishers' uh, revenues on average. And while publishers continue to pursue a strategy with e-books, and they should continue to pursue that strategy, you know, they need to make sure that they're extracting the profits out of their print publications, their print titles, that really uh, make up most of the share of their, their revenues. And you know, what we find is that digital on-demand print technology really helps publishers um, reach greater profitability um, with their print titles as they continue to diversify the revenue mix um, with e-books and other types of digital publications. Um, and, and if we look at that same study, book publishers are uh, certainly understanding the importance of digital printing uh, to their business. And it, it's shown in the chart, um, some offset, well, offset printing is still used today for over half of printed books on average, according to our respondents in the survey. Um, digital printing has gained a lot of momentum. Um, and if you look in, in three years where uh, book publishers say they predict their, their processes to move to, um, they really anticipate that digital printing will usurp offset, that uh, well over half of books are expected to be digitally printed by 2015. Um, and so, you know, that really shows that uh, a lot of publishers are looking at digital printing, looking at that opportunity, and willing to make a switch over the next few years uh, to try and drive profits and, and more efficiencies in the way that they uh, produce print books. Um, and in, you know, advances in digital print productivity uh, will continue to push costs down, and advances in quality will attract even more publishers to investigate uh, and eventually utilize digital print book production because there are a lot of advantages with on-demand and short-run uh, digital printing. Um, you know, and we, we, we've done uh, some research on the uh, print volume side as well from an InfoTrends perspective, and our recent forecast that we came out with on digital print volume really confirms that books will continue to shift from offset to digital printing in a big way. Uh, over the next five years, uh, digital print volume for book applications specifically will grow by a whopping 52 billion pages uh, and at a pretty healthy compound annual growth rate of, uh, of, of 14%. Um, and this growth is really going to be driven by some of the uh, aforementioned productivity uh, improvements, uh, improvements in, in quality. And, um, you know, more digital book production services 
are going to become available for publishers um, that are actually striving for profitability out of the print titles and really want to use uh, digital printing in a more strategic way within their business. Um, and, you know, not only does streamlining book production with digital printing drive profitability from a uh, productivity perspective, that's an important part, uh, but it also frees up book publishers to focus on other profit-generating initiatives and strategies to help grow their businesses even more in, in more diverse types of ways. Uh, we asked publishers in this study that we conducted about which activities of their business they were, they were focused on in terms of growing their business. And, you know, some of the, the top-ranking items like publishing technology standards, new print media trends, uh, new business models, content monetization, all of these activities are um, critically important to ensure the future profitability for book publishers in, in print and beyond. So, uh, you know, they, they need to make sure that um, they're uh, leveraging their print most effectively and being able to, to look at new opportunities with the business models and uh, some of the other things that are related to technology. Um, and to really emphasize this point from the publishing perspective, I, I really want to turn it over to our, our first speaker, Adam Whitworth from O'Reilly Media. Uh, and he's going to provide some great insight from the publisher perspective uh, on O'Reilly's experience with adding digital printing into their production mix, mix and, and some of the benefits and, and existing challenges uh, that they face with, with digital printing. So, uh, Adam, uh, please take it away. Thanks, Brian. I am going to flick to the next slide here. Uh, so I, my name is Adam Whitwer. I'm the Director of Publishing Technology at O'Reilly Media. Uh, as Brian sort of covered in the opening, uh, in, the op in the opening few slides there, uh, O'Reilly, uh, our, our company motto is spreading the knowledge of innovators, and we do that through our books, uh, our technology books, uh, online services, magazines, research, tech conferences, headquartered in uh, Sebastopol, California. It's near Santa Rosa. I work in Cambridge, Mass., with uh, a large pool of editorial and production folk. Uh, approximately 120 uh, titles per year and a large backlist of about 2,000 titles, uh, which made things interesting. And I'll talk more about that as we go. So that's O'Reilly. And we started to think about digital printing for, uh, for many different reasons. Uh, the traditional print cycle, and I'm sure you all know it, but I'll, I'll sort of go through it, right? So a book, a book comes up, uh, the editorial presents it, it is approved, uh, we're going to print it, and the publisher inherits that risk because of the upfront printing cost, you know, it's expensive. So you have to take a guess about what's actually going to, what's going to sell into the retail market. So you, you take that guess and you base it on some sales data and you base it on maybe, if the, in our case, you know, maybe if the technology's hot and you think it's going to stay hot and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then you make a guess and you print. And if you're lucky, they all sell through. Or if you're good, you know, they all sell through. And maybe, maybe that works well. But in three months, maybe, they, maybe they're gone and you have to reprint. And then you have to do the whole thing over again. You know, where, where are we in the technology? Can we print another 10,000 of this? Should it only be 5,000? Uh, and that, that cycle is... Uh, very painful, uh, not, not just from a sort of inventory management point of view, uh, it is, but also from the perspective of when you lose, you can lose really big. Uh, if you guess wrong and you print, you overprint, you're sitting on a stock, you know, potentially in the millions of dollars or more, and it just sits there in the warehouse and eventually you have to make a decision about what you're going to do with that. So we were looking to end that cycle. So from a high level, that's what, what we were looking at. And for a long time, we weren't, uh, we're, we're thinking about this obviously for a long time, like I'm sure many of you, of you have been. And for a long time, we didn't feel like the technology was quite there. That was one, that was one thing. Uh, cost was also very prohibitive, of course. Uh, but also, we didn't think the quality, the quality was good enough uh, at that time. And over, you know, we continued uh, throughout my tenure here at O'Reilly. I remember, you know, several years back, be asking for samples, thinking about whether or not it worked for our content. We have a lot of, for instance, we have a, our, our authors present information on a lot of screenshots, you know, screenshots of the technology that they're using. How did those screenshots come through on a digital printer, you know? And for a long time, we didn't feel like it was, it was there. Uh, but more and more over time, we saw the samples really making drastic improvements over time, and we started to think that, okay, we're getting close that this is really a viable option. And the, what we've wa been wanting to do about making inventory management easier and better and less, less expensive, we started to think that it was a reality. 
So we partnered with LSI, uh, which is a company owned by Ingram and ran by Ingram. Uh, Ingram, it was, it was a natural fit for O'Reilly. We have a long-term business relationship with them, and it made sense uh, for us for many, uh, many reasons for us to work with LSI. Um, and we worked with them and spun up. Uh, we made an announcement in Q, Q1 2011 at the TOC conference, which is a conference that O'Reilly runs for technology publishing. And we made that announcement then, and we've been going with it ever since. I was a part of the initial onboarding team, and there were just a handful of us. And there were, the operational details were daunting, uh, especially at first. And this goes uh, right up and down, uh, you know, the entire sort of, from the time the book is conceived to the time the book is uh, printed and distributed. Uh, it potentially affects things like editorial schedules. Not, not a lot, but it can, so you have, to think about, you have to think about that as well. And I think that was the biggest challenge. And also I think another big challenge was sort of understanding each other's business. Uh, and from that point of view, you know, LSI was, is, not, is not a publisher, and they also did not pr print traditional offsets. So there was a lot of talking through about what the expectations were and what the challenges were on both sides and just sort of rethinking and negotiating that, that, uh, that through. And winding down long par uh, partnerships with other vendors was also a very big deal for us uh, at O'Reilly. You know, we, we had formed these long partnerships uh, with other printers, and I mean, they were, they were almost like family. As you guys know, if you work with a vendor for a long time, they become almost like family. And that, that was hard. Besides the relationship part of it, there was also a lot of details to work through. Uh, in terms of, well, we had say, uh, usually printers would purchase paper on our behalf. So we had a lot of paper on the floor that we were more or less obligated to, so that we had to work through and wind down. You know, so it wasn't it wasn't overnight. Okay, this is it. It's it's over. Click you know, click a button, and we're just doing this. There was definitely a winding down period of the traditional model into uh, a ramping up period of the POD model print-on-demand. So uh, there were quality concerns and shifting expectations along the way, and I could speak to this from a number of different angles. You know, the business had sort of made this decision that we were doing this, so we had to definitely look at what that meant for our books and talk publishers and authors through it, and also make, uh, make maybe adjustments to the way we did things and the way we prepared books and the way that we gave guidelines to authors just because we wanted to optimize things more for this digital printing. And of course, all projects are not suitable for digital printing, and, and that remains true uh, today. So for us personally right now, we're just we're sticking with one color, and I think Kent is going to talk uh, some, about some four-color solutions, and I know that's coming along, and we're excited about the possibilities there as well. But for now, we're just using uh, one-color books, and uh, our, our partner, LSI, was very flexible in terms of uh, trying to do things like adapt their machines to use our normal trim sizes, increase the number that they could, uh, for the, they had a max page count that they couldn't hit, but they, you know, they made that adjustment so that they, they could do it for our larger uh, technical reference books, sometimes, you know, as long as 1,000 pages, less now, but a lot in the back list. And, the other thing is that I think that I think probably maybe was the biggest wake up gold I realized is inventory management doesn't just disappear under this mo model throughout the uh, inventory management remains uh, a challenge of sorts, especially when not all projects are suitable for digital printing. So there are some. So now now we've got these sort of two buckets, right? Some of which we're managing uh, through. So, old channels through uh, the way that we used to do books, and then we've got this other bucket where things are just flowing through in POD. The, the books that are in the POD program are really beautiful in that you do literally put it into the program and you do not, I mean, you do not think about it because it creates a kind of virtual inventory. And your books are just always there and available for retail channels to purchase 
and sell through to customers. So that's really nice. And, and you know, we're out of that, we're out of that cycle. But when some projects aren't suitable, and this might also be not just for color, I should probably say, uh, maybe really high profile file titles where we want to use a specialized paper, or if you have a really highly customized uh, book that you, you know, you want to do the sort of traditional handcraft publisher thing that is great for some projects, and depending on what kind of books publish, it may be all your projects or most of your projects, in which case maybe a POD model wouldn't, wouldn't be ideal. But most of our books, Brian re referred to as sort of templated publishing uh, earlier in the talk, and I think that's most, that makes up the bulk of our books, something probably around the 85% area. So most of our books sort of look and feel similar along a few brands or uh, sort of design lines, right? So there's maybe five or six different series. So that makes them, that makes, you know, we can sort of lock it down in those series and that makes the POD model okay for us because we could work with our partner to say, okay, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we, we realize that we, we can't have 10 different paper stocks to choose from, and we can't have, I don't know, digital foil printing on the cover anymore, but we can, we can have these other things instead, and that's okay. The, the, that compromise is okay. But the, but the room for sort of customization under uh, traditional publishing maybe is not, it's not quite as easy uh, as, it, as, it, as it was. Yeah. Now, now Adam, I, I want to stop and uh, ask you a question. I mean, you mentioned before... Yeah. Um, about uh, having a, to work with your authors a little bit and maybe communicate some changes or communicate some, um, you know, constraints that they had to adhere to and get their feedback. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, you know, what were some of those issues that you ran into and, and you know, how your authors responded and things like that? You have to be really proactive about it if you don't, if you just sort of think about it for us. So you can't wait till the project is, say, in production before you start talking to the authors because they've already shot all their screenshots at that point. So you go back to them and you say, the, you know, these, these don't work. You're basically creating work for them. So you have to sort of go up front uh, and, and send them some samples and say, you know, maybe darker mid tones than you would use normally, and this is how you would set your computer to do that. And maybe uh, a little bit more of a feedback loop until they're there and you get something that'll work. Uh, you, you know, you don't have to do that necessarily, and your mileage may vary depending on which, you know, you know, which technology you're using. And there's not one kind of digital printer. The technology is improving rapidly, and these sorts of conversations, I think, will diminish over time, and sure. which would be great because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to have to worry about that, and I definitely don't want to sacrifice quality. You know, it, I talk about trade-offs, and I, I recognize the trade-offs, but it's a, it's a trade-off trending in a positive direction if you're a publisher, right? Because the, the quality and the, the cost are coming down over time, so maybe you make some trade-offs in the short term, knowing that over time things like, you know, screenshot quality will improve, and it will be less of a hassle and less of a quality concern for you. Sure. Great. Thank you. Sure. So here we are, this is about uh, a year and a half later, and we have 950 titles in the POD program. So this has been really exciting for me. So this, uh, this is sort of particular to O'Reilly. So we have this huge backlist of titles and a lot of niche titles, right? A lot of niche technologies that maybe wouldn't, uh, they, basically they didn't, they weren't mainstream enough to exist in the traditional publishing cycle that I was talking about earlier. They just, you just, it wasn't viable for us to keep them in stock, you know, because you sell 20 a month or something like that. And for us to house that over, especially a backlist of thousands of titles, you know, that, that, that really adds up and we just couldn't, we couldn't possibly do it. So we, we, I really, uh, I really hated that because I want to meet, you know, customer demand, especially old time O'Reilly customers that maybe still use some niche technology that nobody, you know, uses anymore. And that, you know, we have the, we have the only existing book on that topic and I want that to be available to customers. So one of the most exciting parts of this project for me was, you know, once we got sort of past the, the onboarding logistics and we're actually starting to print books and stuff is going back and going through that backlist and, looking about what that demand is and, and also uh, the production challenges of sort of re reviving those books, bringing those files back and making them alive, you know, uh, again. And I think 
that from a sort of, re if you think about it from a revenue perspective, you think, oh, 20 titles a month, you know, who cares? You know, it's not even worth bothering with. And, and I think that's true if you think about it as like one title, right? But it, again, it's cumulative. So when I uh, talk about long tail in, the, in, the, in this context, I'm definitely talking about long tail in a cumulative way across our backlist. So our entire back, uh, our entire back, uh, one one title from one, uh, from our backlist, in with a long t some old technology, it's not that valuable. But if you've got 500 or 600 and they're all sent, selling five, 10, 20 copies a month, all of a sudden you've got you actually got something. You know, you've really got something. And plus, it's exciting because you're maybe servicing old uh, customers that have been around for a long time and um, maybe newer customers that are coming to old technologies, it just really opens up uh, your, uh, your relationship with your customers and you're able to service their needs better. Uh, and that's important to O'Reilly because we have a direct-to-consumer business uh, on O'Reilly.com. Inventory commitment has declined with savings in the seven figures over a very, very short period. And I think that will uh, even get better as printing technologies get better and we're able to move more books into that POD bucket that I was talking about. And the fact that we are saving so much over short, such a short period of time is uh, super exciting and really is bearing fruit for all the work and all the things that we were planning for over the years. So it's really nice to see this paying off after, uh, after so much time. Uh, and I'll come back to the business opportunities one. I was going to talk about errata and the new content. So this is also important for O'Reilly. We publish on technology that is changing fast. Uh, new versions of technology comes out, and sometimes you have an author you know, who's really engaged and the author wants to keep that book up to date, for instance. You know, maybe he or she wants to rewrite a chapter uh, you know, describing the new version of that of that software product. Uh, and before, it was like, well, you know, your book will run out of stock in six months, and then maybe we can publish an update then. But now, it's not like that at all. It's we, we can say, okay, you know, when do you want to do it? Let's 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 do it. We'll work with the author. Um, and then and then more sort of day to day, we try to we try to address uh, errata for those books. So basically, flat out errors. So customers. Uh, our customers will regularly uh, send in errata via our website. You know, this is wrong and that is wrong. We work with the author to fix that errata and then push out updates. And so that has actually been a whole new program that we've had to spin up as a result of this, sort of thinking about how to, how to sanely manage that has actually be, been really interesting. So now, so now we're thinking we try to do maybe like 10 books per week where we're publishing some set of errata updates and pushing them out to customers. And I, I want to ramp that up even more where we're, do, you know, where we're doing more, or maybe it's not even tied to a regular weekly schedule. It's just more of kind of an ongoing thing. Uh, so that has been really uh, very awesome and interesting uh, and giving us a lot of opportunities uh, for keeping our books up to date and keeping the books better and uh, more relevant over time. And the new business opportunities, uh, I think these are small and we're just th starting to see uh, what the possibilities are here. Uh, so there were before we didn't really have a way, an easy way. We do trade shows and conferences, so we didn't really have an easy way of say slapping together a sort of quick book and then printing off a bunch of copies that look reasonably good without. I, I mean, I suppose you could do it at Kinko's and it costs you a fortune. You know, it's like five thousand dollars or something to print up a few hundred copies. But now we have a lot of flexibility uh, with this POD partner. We can kind of put something together quickly. It wouldn't go through the normal editorial production process, but more, works maybe uh, as a sample of upcoming content or maybe an essay that we published on the website that got a lot of traction that we think is really relevant to the conference. So now we can we can put it into print and we can print we can print it up and hand it out and uh, it, it goes it, it can uh, also works in with other sponsorship deals. We can maybe get uh, sponsorship advertising that goes on that that customized book and then we can print that up and pass it out at the conference. So we're just we're just sort of starting to really explore that and it's just giving us flexibility uh, that we I think that we're really just beginning to understand. Uh, and okay, so I should probably wrap up, but I, that, that's kind of where we are in 2012, and I think we're taking questions at the end. So at this point, I am going to hand it over to Kent. Thanks, Adam. This is Kent Larson, 
and I'm with Bridgeport National Bindery, and all of what Adam has said uh, over the course of the last uh, few minutes is what I'm going to put into a manufacturer's perspective. So what he has kind of described, um, we have been on the very back end of, of that model um, where we are going in, in manufacturing books. So let me give you a brief background of who we are. And for, for those of you who know who I am and I have met you, you'll know that I get to be a little fast. So I'll try to slow it down here, not to get overly excited um, and spastic. So uh, here we go. Um, we are Bridgeport National Bindery. Uh, we're in Massachusetts, uh, just down the road from where uh, Adam was speaking, uh, a company that's been uh, around since 1947. So this is our 65th year, and we are primarily a library binder uh, as a history. So we're taking uh, January through June issues of Sports Illustrated and binding them together for a library. Uh, that's kind of the, uh, the methodology we have and, honestly, the mindset where every book matters. Uh, we have five divisions uh, of, different uh, of different products. I manage the print-on-demand division. Um, case binding for printers needing high-quality finishing um, started back in 1991. In the fall of 91, we started getting calls from printers who were producing um, really glorified photocopies uh, at that point, and they needed a source for case binding, which is our primary focus. Um, and it wasn't until 03 when quantities dropped to a small run lengths, uh, one-offs, five-offs, where we decided that we needed to get into printing as opposed to putting uh, printed material into a box and UPSing it to us uh, to have us unload two books and uh, bind them. Uh, it was much better to send the digits, and that's kind of how we backed into this. So we're a binder that backed up the production chain all the way to the very front end. Uh, and that's our history. So this next slide is going to show you a little bit of a progression here. Um, on the far left uh, is a long time ago uh, in digital, uh, what digital has done to production, where books were produced offset uh, in large quantities and a very high expectation of quality. And about 20 years ago, digital printing entered it, uh, the picture, and uh, the quality uh, was a little bit lower on the print side. Um, nevertheless, there was some desire to try to make sure the, the, the product was, was adequate. And I think Adam even uh, you know, mentioned that even now, where today there's still some of that we want to continue to get the better product. Ten years ago, digital printing uh, started getting into the picture even more. Um, look, quantities started getting even lower. And the traditional pr uh, production and distribution distribution models were still in place though and so there was some confusion that was going on sometimes things would get produced in a run length of you know 75 books but being sent to a warehouse and the warehouse had no idea what to do with them so those those models were how this uh, this kind of evolved um, fast forward to today where we can't even remember what we did yesterday uh, you've got social media and smartphones and tablets and apps and there is so much choice out there um, both for physical and electronic formats um, digital printing allows that. It allows the production, production of quality and convenience. It's reducing uh, or offering no inventory for warehouses for publishers who, who make that jump. Um, and it's, there's a big growth of direct-to-user fulfillment uh, for printed books and obviously e-books, as you see that those numbers just uh, grow year over year. Um, and it really is truly about uh, the long tail of the book, as Adam made reference to, that these books sometimes will only sell 20 books a month. So how do you put that into a distribution model? How do you put that into a uh, manufacturing model that works? What does it mean for digital printing? There are basically three styles uh, of publishers who seek us out, or I should say customers who seek us out, uh, and are new in, uh, looking for new ways to sell their product. Uh, primarily, uh, the publishers have been few and far between, honestly, for Bridgeport National Bindery. Uh, it is not uh, the traditional publisher that would knock on our doors. Uh, more, uh, moreover, it's it's the traditional publisher who would know how to how to connect with a, a book of one uh, supplier. So it's really been a lot of innovators. It's been people who have uh, thought differently about files, thought differently about production, um, and honestly, some publishers that have really taken a huge risk uh, to take their backlog, uh, their backlist, and digitize it that have come to us. Um, it is also e-commerce uh, customers. Uh, it is people who are startups who, you know, after the first web bust uh, back in 2000, saw the opportunity then uh, a decade ago to really get into content creation, whether it's author-driven or, or honestly soccer mom-driven, um, to build photo books. Uh, those types of people started these uh, Internet portals, uh, and they needed a back end for high-quality production. And my favorite 
um, is honestly the individuals. Uh, it is so fun to, for us to take phone calls or to get emails from individuals who are literally looking to have 50 books produced uh, for their uh, for their local congregation, or they're looking to have a 250 books produced for their high school, or they could be soft cover, they could be hard cover, and th- these are the people that we're we are dealing with. But the one thing that unites all of these three uh, is that they know that their content matters, uh, and they want it available in any format, and they want their content available whenever. They don't want to wait for it. Um, they certainly want high quality, uh, and they're looking at the total cost of having the book available, inventory-free, not simply just the cost of manufacturing. Bottom line is that each book ordered needs to make money uh, for the customer and for us so that it is truly a hot knife through butter all the way through the production channel. And so the question is, how do you do that? How does that whole process then work? And so this is the part of the talk where I get into the nuts and bolts of how we do it here at Bridgeport. And I'll preface this by simply saying we are just one solution. There are many, many ways to skin this cat, and we do not, we certainly do not um, have it all down, and this, there are many new ways to innovate. Uh, we just simply offer what we do, and many of you who are probably on the phone here uh, are doing it just as good or probably better than we are. And so these are just some ways in which we do it uh, that suits our customers. But basically, uh, it is uh, taking uh, the first bullet point there is using EDI. The traditional publishers are used to an electronic uh, data ex- uh, interchange where uh, the metadata is passed. Uh, the files are not. Uh, the files are pretty, are pretty set. So we receive physical books to scan, or more commonly these days, we receive um, digital files for the cover, digital files for the text, digital files for color inserts, digital files for a dust jacket, uh, or digital files even for foldouts. Uh, and we put those into a, into a database, and then we let the metadata or the EDI uh, just ping our system uh, day in and day out um, and constantly sending orders to us. So what it would look like would be a, a customer who we set up to do, say, a batch pull once a day at 9 o'clock in the morning could be a total of 78 books. 78 separate books, or it could be 78 books that are five titles of this uh, paperback and five titles of that hardcover. It's all mixed, uh, and it's uh, totally driven by what the publisher wants to do because this is an inventory-free system. It's all about uh, not having anything sitting in a warehouse. The second bullet point is really designed for those folks who are these Internet portals, um, the people who are building software uh, solutions for photo books or for authors who can, can create uh, an author and build uh, and uh, uh, democratize publishing. And what they're simply doing is uploading PDFs or creating uh, the, the book inside the, the web-based uh, uh, template and simply passing that through, and that routes eventually to us on the back end. And once we produce that, that file is coming in with not only the data, but it's also coming in with the text and with the cover file. And once we produce that, we purge it so it never, uh, it never can be recycled because that author, the very next minute or the very next day, could be updating page five, uh, and they are completely in control. And then the third bullet point, which is the one that I had said uh, I really kind of have an affinity for because it's the individuals, this is where people will simply call us and say, I want to produce books. How do I do that? And we simply say, well, here's the FTP site. Here's a link. Uh, drop in your PDF text. Drop in your PDF cover. And uh, we'll do a proof for you. And uh, once the proof is done, if you like it, then uh, we'll just produce how many you want. Do you want 55? Do you want 82? What do you want? Uh, and that's what we do. So the key here uh, is that this gives people various streams to get their products out. The next slide simply is where, uh, where this digital workflow uh, gives – there are different paths that our production, uh, our production um, model here uh, deals with. It's uh, taking all of these files on the front end from these three different sources, and then we have to integrate that with various print engines. And those print engines have to be you know, black and white uh, text. They have to be color. Uh, they have to be uh, sized for dust jackets. They have to be sized for covers. Uh, and it's uh, making sure those uh, print engines are there and then integrated with the binding solutions. Uh, and so there are some that are inline. There are some that are nearline. 
um, and we have both paperback and case-bound systems that we are developing uh, as well. How we do this um, with regards to binding, because we are, we are really honestly a case binder. Um, we do paperback binding, and that's more of a trade thing, but our, our forte clearly is in, the, is in the hardcover world. So what Adam had mentioned earlier about some of those things that you might have to sacrifice over time, well, there are some things that you just you don't have to sacrifice in some ways. And, and how we play in this field is that we tend to offer solutions, whether they're trim sizes, whether they're uh, page extents that go up to you know 1,800 pages or even 2,200 pages with a lighter style or doing things that are a little out of the ordinary, that's kind of our niche. That's kind of what we focus on. And so in that space, the case binding, we offer a several different styles. Uh, PVA, which is a, uh, it's, it's a polymer. It's a, it's a double-sand adhesive process that allows us to uh, then bind our books with a rounded spine, which is a very traditional look for many uh, publishers and individuals. And it offers a sense of, of quality and a sense of class that people uh, definitely uh, pursue and want. Um, it's not for every book that we do. Uh, the next one, PUR, is polyurethane, and that's perfect for uh, the books that are being produced for um, really for the photo book industry, uh, incredibly strong, uh, and allows us to deal with the coated stocks. Uh, we do a lot of side stitching for children's books, books that are under, say, a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, we'll go ahead and put a side stitching on that and use that for the, for the library and the children's market. Um, and we are printing those uh, covers on a number of different uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of, you think of a digital uh, c company out there making equipment, and we've probably got the equipment that we're uh, producing on. And then we use cloth uh, and also foil uh, with dust jackets as well. Uh, some paperbacks, saddle stitching, comb binding are also what we're doing. And the next slide gives you a little bit of an uh, understanding of what exactly this looks like. So that, that upper left and the middle picture shows you a book that goes through that polymer, that PVA. That's a cold glue. It's not a hot melt. So that book coming out of that machine is not going to dry and get cased into a cover within a couple of hours. It's actually got a cure uh, so that it will have the ability to then give you that uh, round that you see in the upper right-hand corner. Um, so this is really the methodology where we come from. Um, and as I've talked, um, I've mentioned a lot about the front end, the system pulling in files. I've just mentioned a little bit about where we, where we bind and how quality still matters, and there's a lot of that that's still important. But ultimately, to the, to the profitability of where this goes, there is nothing more important than being able to communicate to a customer, whether they're a publisher, an online company, or, uh, or an individual that at the very back end, the fulfillment uh, and the in, uh, and the final, uh, just basically getting the um, the payment taken care of and in, uh, is is all set. There's nothing that has to be done. It's all in line and backed up. That is key. And so that's where I'm going to head for the next few minutes here as I wind this presentation down. So basically, the digital back end solutions. You can imagine. Um, you can imagine each day here we might we might have you know on average 1500 shipments going out that could be that could be 1500 separate books um, or it could be it would, no, it would never be one shipment of 1,500. There's just no way it would, it would be that way. Um, our average is two and a half books per order. So you can do the math and figure out how many different things we're doing here. And every single one of those books that gets produced, we've got to invoice and back up and make sure that it is done correctly so that when we do the final billing, it backs up correctly. So um, a shipment can be one to 1,000. Um, we're using UPS, FedEx, U.S. Postal Service, Common Carrier, we're shipping domestically. We're shipping internationally. Uh, the packing list, if you see that there, can reference the publisher information so that we are completely invisible. Uh, we are basically a back-end solution so that the, the person who ordered this, whether they're an individual online or whether they're a, um, a, distri a distributor or whether they're a bookstore, uh, that carton, that box that goes to the end user is showing up looking like it came from the, the content provider, whether that, in this illustration here, whether it's John Wiley and Sons or whether it's Blurb. We love to be invisible. Um, we just, that's the way we, we do it. We're, we're total back end. So all shipments have to be confirmed electronically. If we produce one book that has 86 pages, we need to make sure that those 86 pages are 86 pages at X amount per page, uh, one bound book at X because it's a hardcover, and all of that is itemized. Um, and each order has printing, binding, shipping label uh, itemized, uh, invoicing by individual orders, 
uh, on a weekly, bi-monthly, or monthly basis. Um, at the end of the day, that last line there, digital workflows and digital print uh, provide publishers with an easier path to profit. And I think Adam alluded to that earlier where he just kind of said, once it's in that system, I don't think about it. It's just there. And that is our goal. We want to be that back-end manufacturer that says, here, you do it. And I just sit back and know that those titles just continue to happen, whether they're uh, a publisher who has uh, – backlisted titles that just get put into this long tail, or whether they're uh, a web-based portal that's creating content and it needs to be produced really well. That's what our whole, uh, our whole goal is. Um, where digital printing is taking Bridgeport National Bindery, and I'm simply going to start by saying this, uh, digital printing is taking Bridgeport National Bindery in one place, and that is we do not sell binding or printing services. Um, that's what we do, but what we have to sell is time. Um, our process here has got to be done in a quick turnaround. It's got to be done in quality. Um, and at the end of the day, speed is what matters. And this is where the e, um, the e-commerce, uh, not e-commerce, the e-books uh, have really grown. The tablets are just so immediate. Uh, and it's so much more convenient to this generation of, uh, of humans uh, to just get their, their information. That said, the physical book is never going to go away. It is always going to be there. There will always be a reason to have a physical printed book. The way in which it, which it gets produced is different. And I heard a speaker uh, last year make a comment that was absolutely very, very poignant, and that is it's not like Field of Dreams where it's if they build it, you will come. It's if they come, you'll build it. And that's kind of where we see ourselves. And so it's all about the time. You've got to build it right, and you've got to get it done quick. And um, what we have seen, and you'll forgive me, this slide is probably a little dated, um, but just showcases where um, the growth in POD will be, and that is, on average, our digital print operation has seen year-over-year growth of 38% of or more. It's actually, we're even more than that this year, which is tremendous. Um, and an article in Publishers Weekly of last year, it said that there were, you can read the statistics right there, I don't need to read them for you, but there are so many new titles produced uh, in 2010, um, majority of those were non-traditional. Um, and so that doesn't even take into consideration the fact that there are these uh, photo books that are being done on a day, day in and day out basis. And so what we see is that digital printing, we don't know anything else. We've never done offset. Uh, we've only gotten into digital. Um, we see digital printing as, as really the future not only of our business, but really of where printing is heading. So those are the models that we have adopted. Uh, that's the kind of the niche that we play in. Um, and we see growth happening. So for any of you out there who have uh, invested or are looking to invest in this kind of model, whether you're a manufacturer or whether you're a publisher, it makes a whole lot of sense um, to put things into, the, into that long tail. And I'll just conclude by simply saying, that we have been living in the world of, of really the scientific, technical, medical market, kind of was the first market to kind of get into this. And then it has gotten into like the photo book space and people who are dealing with, um, you know, there's higher margins there. Um, the, next, the next thing to come is how are we going to make this work so that trade uh, can get more involved or is there going to be a, a way in which um, there is going to be just the ability to look and say financially it doesn't make sense. The models that exist, work is going to come back to America and not going to be produced overseas in long run lengths. It's going to be produced here in short quantities and batches and people are willing to pay a little bit more for that. Who knows if that's what's going to happen. But the fine art community right now is starting to realize that there's some digital printing uh, that uh, can be done one-off uh, in small batches uh, and not necessarily have to go to large, uh, long run lengths overseas. And so that's where, it's, where we see some, some interesting things happening in the next, um, in the next couple, of, uh, couple of years. Great, great, Kent. Uh, thank you very much. That was um, a very, very good perspective in terms of, um, you know, what's really going on with digital print technology for book publishing and some of the opportunities uh, that are there with with digital print and on demand. Um, you know, we have uh, a number of questions um, that have come up. I just have a few uh, recommendations and conclusions to go through, and then we'll uh, put up some questions for uh, Adam and Kent uh, to answer. Um, so, uh, just kind of in summary here, you know, publishers that take advantage of digital print technology 
um, they're really going to be able to drive profits from their print titles by, uh, for, with a number of different reasons, for getting support for complex uh, content management and distribution workflows, reducing or eliminating physical inventory and warehouse space, getting access to logistical and warehousing services, and, and tight integration throughout the value chain. These, these types of benefits really help streamline um, the, the business and production processes related to short-run or on-demand printing. Uh, they really keep, keep uh, costs down uh, and maximize profits for publishers uh, that, that want to be more flexible in the way that they uh, produce book titles. Um, you know, digital print technology enables publishers to explore uh, new supply chain models um, and even new business models. Uh, while publishers have a variety of services um, that you could conduct in-house related to production, some processes can now be outsourced to a digital print partner, somebody like Bridgeport National Bindery, uh, to free up some internal resources and explore uh, new opportunities or simply to develop a more productive workflow when it comes to, to digital printing. Um, in terms of recommendations, uh, publishers really need to evaluate kind of the build buyer partner scenario uh, when it comes to short run or on-demand printing to kind of determine your company's approach to this. Uh, in terms of book manufacturers looking, at, looking ahead, book manufacturers that offer digital printing services uh, continue to evolve and, and make their solutions more productive, uh, more flexible for book publishers. Uh, more variety of, of substrates, um, more support for uh, full color, uh, a lot of more capabilities that, that uh, decrease the constraints that are put on um, on-demand digital printing. These manufacturers will continue to automate their workflows to help reduce costs, even on the shortest of runs. They're going to update their core printing technologies for more productivity and higher quality. Uh, and they'll integrate more tightly with the supply chain and offer a broader, broader array of uh, electronic publishing solutions for multi-channel delivery. That's an area where we see um, some potential as well. And, and just to summarize, you know, it's clear that book publishers realize there's tremendous benefits to digital print technology as they seek out areas of growth in, in a very much changing industry and evolving industry. As we noted earlier, print book titles still comprise the majority of revenues for book publishers. Uh, and those publishers want to ensure that those, book, those printed books remain profitable for them, uh, even when e-books are growing in use and when the revenue source is diversifying. And so as a result, in the next three years, publishers expect to uh, continue to aggressively shift uh, their production process from uh, offset to digital to help uh, meet these goals. Um, and by using digital print technology, opportunities created to introduce uh, new titles with less risk and reintroduce existing titles, that kind of long tail opportunity that we talked about, uh, to, to go out to new audiences or audiences that could not previously be uh, reached. Uh, it can open up distribution channels. It can reduce risk and increase capital. It can encourage new business models, and ultimately uh, digital technology can, can drive profits. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just a, a summary of what we've talked about today. I think it's been uh, a great uh, discussion, uh, uh, presentations that we had from Adam and Kent. I want to jump to... Uh, a few questions as we have about uh, six or seven minutes left on the call here. Um, so as I look through the, the Q&A, uh, I'll uh, take this first uh, question to Adam. Um, uh, one person asked in terms of the, the role of the cloud and, and um, how you're using that within your business. I mean, can you comment on that a little bit? Uh, what role does it have in your business and, and what role do you see it playing in the future, particularly with the storage of digital content, digital content for uh, being used for digital printing, those types of things. Uh, sure. Uh, Brian, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Uh, sorry, I was on mute there uh, momentarily. Uh, so the cloud. Um, gosh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, we. I imagine as cloud technology gets cheaper, we will use it more frequently than we do now for things like archiving. Uh, right now, uh, I use we use a lot of uh, cloud technology for spinning up experimental web applications and whatnot relating to publishing technology experiments and one-offs that we're doing, uh, but not so much related to this digital printing uh, forum per se. So I don't personally use vendor-supplied storage, although I, when I, I have I do appreciate when a vendor keeps my uh, my uh, files on uh, 
you know, storage because there have been a few times when I've needed it as a backup. But personally, uh, one of the things I've really tried to do uh, is have a really strong uh, backup system here at O'Reilly. Uh, and moving that to the cloud, yes, maybe as it as it gets uh, as it gets cheaper. And then in that case, I would probably use something like Amazon S3 or you know one one of the other services uh, rather than maybe a vendor by the, by vendor a print vendor uh, than I would anything else. Sure. Okay. Great. Thanks for thanks for that perspective. Sure. Um, and we have a we have a question for Kent here in terms of uh, and and I'll kind of paraphrase this one a little bit. But could you talk about um, the waste with with digital print technology and and I guess you know how you how much waste is there in your process and and I would assume because it's a book of one not much but um, you know how do you account for that how do you ensure you have the least amount of waste possible uh, in in digital print book production? It's a great question. We generally honestly don't have uh, any waste. We try not to have uh, anything in our process where we print anything extra or have any waste. So you can imagine uh, on average day we're getting books in for quantities of one, some books are quantity of 50. We're producing the exact order that comes in. Now that said, obviously technology is technology and you're going to get a paper jam uh, or you're going to have maybe some damage uh, in, the, in the process. What we simply do is that as there is a paper jam or something were to happen to that book, we will reprint pages. We will not reprint a whole entire book. Um, if, there is a, uh, if there is a problem with, a, uh, with a, an order, we will, we will repair it rather than try to reprint it. Um, there are certain internal reprint rates that we monitor pretty carefully, and we use those rates to then go back to our various digital printers, uh, vendors, to be able to say, hey, guys, this is something that we've been seeing as a problem with, you know, with your press. Or, and so we're able to track that. Um, ironically, we had gotten into traditional edition binding back in the late 80s. And we went to people and said, hey, guys, we're Bridgeport National Bindery. Send us your press sheets, and we'll fold and gather and smice so and make long book run, long, long runs for you. And we were terrible at it because we would take an inordinate amount of time uh, being able to – we don't want to waste anything. So our mindset is clearly geared towards no waste, and we, we monitor that very carefully. Okay, great, great. Um, and I guess this is a, a question for – uh, both of you, if you if you have a perspective on this, and, and Adam, you you might have a little bit more, but you know, um, can you talk a little bit? And I know it's probably dependent on variables, but can you talk a little bit about uh, the the per unit cost of of how digital print compares with something like offset? Um, and you know, you mentioned that the the cost for a while, for a long time, was was too high, but it, it's finally not cost prohibitive anymore. So can, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, it, it's comparable for us. It's comparable for one color titles to traditional offset. Uh, okay. It becomes a little bit less. It trends toward as the page count gets really higher, uh, really high. Like I, you know, I mentioned some of the old titles that we have eight, eight hundred, a thousand pages. It tend, offset sort of uh, clobbers POD in that case, <laughs> but uh, still, I mean, over, overall, especially when you consider that we do a lot more short books, it sort of evens out in the end, so per unit cost is, is very comparable. Sure. Okay, great. Um, and I think uh, I have time for maybe one or two more questions, uh, and there's, there's a lot of great ones up here. Um, so, you know, this one's for Kent in terms of, and there's been a few people that have asked about this, um, in terms of some of the constraints around uh, paper type, trim size, those types of things, um, you know, where, where do you see that going in terms of being able to open that up or, or being a little bit more flexible in terms of uh, substrate choice, trim size choice, and obviously you're doing hardcover and things like that, so also the different types of case binding and things like that. Where, where do you see that going over the next few years? Good question. Uh, for the on-demand, the true one-off program, we have four papers that we run for black and white, and we have five papers that we run for color. Uh, I'm sorry, six papers that we now run for color. Um, you, prior, you pretty much want to keep it constrained. However, when we do short runs that are kind of more of a manual process, and a short run to us is a run length of 25 or higher, we will we will entertain special special papers. Uh, we will entertain going to different trim sizes. Um, so there's a little bit more flexibility on our end. Um, I honestly think that that the model going forward is going to be to get even more restrictive for the one-offs, because it's going to allow speed 
because speed is going to ultimately matter more than 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 what the substrate is or what the trim size size is in terms of my opinion that said if someone wants to do a little bit more of uh, of a production run of over 25 books there is a little bit more flexibility there but i think the only way to really scale this is to really uh, keep your keep your uh, guard up towards limit limiting certain trim sizes and certain page counts, um, and then and then eventually that's where you will drive out cost and of, allow your product to be made uh, affordably uh, and very quick because I think time sells. Sure, great. That's a great perspective, and and I you know I think we're at the top of the hour right now, so I think we're going to have to leave it at that. We've got a lot of, lots of great questions, and so we'll work to. Uh, coordinate that with the speakers and make sure we, we get answers um, for everybody. But uh, Adam and Ken, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, great presentations. I think you provided a lot of great insight. And thank you, everybody uh, out there, um, for joining this, this webinar today. And I, I hope, uh, I hope you have got a lot out of it, and I hope you have a, a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.